Saints of the Americas is a series that seeks to share information on the life and times of the saints of the Catholic Church celebrated in the Americas. Your program hosts are Father Jim Corda and Father Jack Lavelle. Welcome to our show. We're going to begin by talking about Rose Hawthorne Lathrop. And I think in our first uh, saint that we're going to talk about, Rose Hawthorne obviously is the daughter of Nathaniel Hawthorne. And it might be good for us to share with the folks that are with us a little background, uh, not only about Nathaniel Hawthorne, but his wife, Sophie, as well. Uh, we know that uh, in 1850, he wrote The Scarlet Letter, a very famous book. Mm -hmm. And then a year later, Rose was born. And so she grew up in this uh, New England Puritan background, uh, but also there's some other interesting facts about her parents that would be appropriate for us to share prior to her becoming a Catholic. Well, in addition to her father being you know, the great novelist, her mother, whose name was Sophie Peabody, could trace her ancestry all the way back to the Mayflower. And so you certainly see in this family, as you said, this very staunch Puritan New England family. And like many families in the United States at that time, uh, Catholicism was not a thought of theirs. Um, uh, Protestantism was really the, the pervading religion of the day. And so this sense of conversion that comes into Rose's life um, would have been a, a very foreign concept to many of her contemporaries. And we can only imagine what it would have meant um, for her in society. Now we know that it wasn't too much of a challenge in her life. She uh, married a man named George Lathrop who was the editor of Atlantic Monthly. And so we see that that literary sense uh, pervaded not only her upbringing, but also was what uh, carried her into uh, her early days as a, as a bride and a young wife. Uh, but it's very interesting. There's a lot of uh, different people whose stories are part of conversion, more so than we think of it these days. But this really would have been um, not just a, a change in religion, but a change in culture, a change in society, perhaps even a change in how many of the families that you were used to um, socializing with would have, would have continued to be part of your life. Let's talk a little bit about her uh, early life as a young married woman and mother. Uh, as you had mentioned, she marries uh, this George Parson Lathrop. And uh, at the age of, of 29, uh, her four-year-old child dies. And uh, it's their only child. Mm -hmm. And so what is, is, is in the hearts of, of young families who really lose a child at that young age, and probably even back then, when that probably was something that happened often. Well, and certainly, you know, as you look at many families, probably every family that had a child lost a child. Um, we just know that there are more families had large numbers of children. So it is unique uh, to a certain extent. We don't know what the reasons were that there would have only been one child. That would have been rare for families of that, of that time period. But we know that they have one child, they lose that child, and so that becomes a great strain mm -hmm. on their relationship. For uh, Rose, uh, solace in her faith. For George, unfortunately, we know that he turned to the bottle mm -hmm. and, and became an alcoholic. Um, because of that, they then separate. So, you know, it puts all that strain on their relationship. And then sadly, a few years after their separation, he dies. And so we know that Rose feels completely alone, and not just alone in terms of there's no child there anymore, there's no husband there anymore, but alone in direction. And this desire to discover a purpose for their life. Um, you know, we see now that, and when they separated, she was 40, so now mm -hmm. she's beyond childbearing years. Um, so she really has to think, what is her future? Had she been younger, maybe she would have remarried and had other children. But at this point, she has to discover her purpose. And so then we see where she finds that direction. What's also interesting is that her purpose uh, was something that was basically instilled in her uh, through her, her family and her Puritan background and upbringing, uh, which would have been a compassion for uh, those who were ailing, those who were poor, those who were suffering. And we see this uh, inspiration in her life uh, taking on cancer patients. Cancer obviously back uh, in the um, middle of the 19th century was something very foreign to the medical field and the science field. They would have thought that cancer was contagious. And so people who had cancer were usually um, 
uh, quarantined or, or put in sanitariums or institutions where they had hardly any contact with the outside world. And we see that this uh, disease brings her compassion and her life and her purpose uh, to a forefront. And let's talk about how she goes to this place where she's actually ministering to these cancer patients. Well, and, and at the forefront of that movement, if you will, in her life, was uh, we know that she had a great um, affinity for two particular saints, St. Saint Vincent de Paul and then um, uh, Father Damien. Uh, who is known for his work with the lepers. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that she brings those two saints together in ministering to the poor who have this disease that is considered to be another form of leprosy, if you will, that removes them from the community. And so it does have her move into that ministry and into that compassion. One might also think that she was attracted to people who suffered a stigma. Mm -hmm. And as we said, with having only the one child that died, she herself might have been seen as a woman who carried with her this stigma mm -hmm. that kind of had society not seeing her of being total worth or total value, mm -hmm. regardless of money, regardless of background. Mm -hmm. And so she had that affinity with her love of the saints that, that I just mentioned mm -hmm. and her own difficulties. And so she does move forward um, uh, to this place where she wants to start this, this great ministry to cancer patients. We've got about two minutes left of our time together. So let's go into uh, her finding this, uh, this niche for her own self, but then creating uh, this place that turns out to be a, a, a hospitality place for those who are suffering uh, from cancer and disease. Uh, we know that um, after her husband died, uh, she's visited by uh, a Dominican priest who uh, talks to her, especially about her uh, statue that she has in her place, which is of St. Rose of Lima. And so that's basically because of her name, her patron saint. And he suggests that uh, the two women, uh, Rose, and then she has a companion, Alice Huber, who joins her in this ministry uh, to the sick. Uh, they're invited to become Dominican tertiaries. And so they do that. Uh, she becomes a mother Alfonsa and Alice becomes a sister Rose. And later mm -hmm. this congregation, which is approved um, not only through uh, the Vatican, but also through the Archdiocese of New York is called the Servants of Relief for Incurable Cancer. And then that becomes her ministry throughout uh, the rest of her life. So let's talk briefly in closing about this ministry to the incurable. Well, and again, I think it goes back to that sense of, of trying to provide as much dignity and worth and compassion for people who are disposable in society. And, and we could translate it into any other group of people in our current day. Uh, but that really is what she was battling. And she, she did it for the rest of her life to the age of 75. I believe she dies in 1926. But it was really reaching out to those that were seen as because of this diagnosis or this illness, you're no longer of value. And so what she was discovering was and what she wanted to offer them, knowing that because it was incurable, almost all of them were going to die and probably die quickly by the time they get to her. But to provide them to the very last moment on this earth with that dignity and that reverence and that respect, that that illness did not define them. Being a child of God defined them. And that had to be her response. And I think that's why we're discussing her today as someone who's on the road to sainthood. It wasn't that she worked with cancer patients, but it was what she tried to bring to their lives. And we're going to talk about another saint in a moment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Society of St. Paul announces a new book called Saints of the USA by Brother Marco Bucarelli. This book for children ages six and up will fascinate young readers as they learn more about the saints of North America. Those who read it will meet 10 figures who have lived lives of holiness, as well as the Immaculate Conception of Mary, patroness of the United States. The book can be found at St. Paul's Books and Gifts at 926 Boardman Poland Road on Route 224. The store is open Monday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. or call 330-953-2443 or email at stpaulsbookstore at gmail.com and learn more about these saints of our time.
I am Marino. Yo soy Marino. Marino, an American Catholic organization of priests and brothers, has been reaching out to those in need for nearly 100 years in 26 countries throughout the world. Missioners, workers, volunteers, supporters, we are all Marino. I'm Father Mike, and I am Marino. 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 Welcome back to our show. The saint we're going to talk about now is Angeline McCrory. You know, Angeline was born in 1893 in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, in Ulster. And so she comes from a very, very Catholic background. Uh, we, we see that uh, Angeline then with her family as a young age, at, a, at a young age moves to Scotland. And then she enters, um, at the age of 19, the Little Sisters of the Poor, and hence begins uh, her religious journey. And so let's pick it up there. Where, where is that journey leading her and what is that ministry all involved? Well, certainly just from their title, The Little Sisters of the Poor, um, we see that Angeline had a desire to serve the poor. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges that we're going to see in her life is her definition of who is poor. Mm -hmm. So, but her first calling to this uh, initial religious order was to serve those who were impoverished. Um, to recognize God's blessing in her own life um, and to meet the needs of those that was the charism of that order, to reach out to those who were poor. Now certainly around the time that she's serving, there is a great deal of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking, you know, 1915 in the United States, by the time she's here, uh, you know, we're just getting into World War I, but we're also even with the industrialized revolution that happens, we're still a country that hasn't discovered a full middle class yet. You either are of great means or there's one form of poverty or another. And so what the Sisters of the Little Poor were looking at were those who really had nothing. Um, and that would have been part of her service and her ministry. But it's interesting, she wants to broaden or expand that understanding of who is poor, and that takes her on a different journey then. You know, it's interesting because the rule of her order uh, with the Little Sisters of the Poor uh, was that their, this home that she had created for the poor must accept only those who were indigent. Mm -hmm. But then she's kind of expanded that to include those who were uh, elderly, who not only had no money, but no companionship mm -hmm. and no purpose or joy in their life. And so isn't that kind of the sense of, of what we are to be about to broaden our sense of, of neighbor, of, mm -hmm. of who is in need? You know, so much we, we kind of parochialize those people that we minister to. Uh, but here we see in the life of Angeline that she broadens that, which causes her to have to change her religious order to another order where she could actually minister fully to her calling. And where does that lead her? Well, that leads her to discover the Carmelite sisters, mm -hmm. um, where within that order and within their charism, and, and I think it's a reminder to everybody listening that every religious community has particular charisms. Mm -hmm. You know, we're used to, uh, whether they are the teaching brothers or sisters, or whether they work more in health care, um, maybe those charisms aren't so narrowly defined in these days, mm -hmm. but they certainly were part of charisms of, of religious orders. And so she finds in the Carmelites an ability to still work with the poor, but to expand that. And as you said, you know, the elderly or those who might be without companionship, without any care or concern. And, and I do think it reminds us that that sense of when we look at those who are impoverished, it could be physical, it could be spiritual, it could be financial, it could be emotional, mm -hmm. but to fulfill someone's needs. And, and I think her sense of, of poverty, especially with the elderly, took her back and hearkened her back to early days in her own life. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that uh, recalling for her was the life of her own grandfather, mm -hmm. you know, who she felt was uh, not only elderly, but, but lonely and, and at times hungry and poor because coming from Northern Ireland where they would have had uh, poverty, she would have experienced that firsthand. And it, 
in the life of her own grandfather. So that carried her through her uh, 91 years of life in, in ministry. We know that she spent 14 years as a little sister of the poor, and then 55 years as a Carmelite uh, in serving uh, in the Bronx in New York. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting as we, as we talk about this expansion of her life in ministry, we know that uh, the Carmelite sisters who worked with the aged and infirmed really grew into um, a whole bevy of sisters. I think uh, 300 sisters at the time uh, who serviced um, in 50 different sites and in 30 dioceses around the United States. So this whole ministry that she began with the indigent poor and elderly really grew and other people took it on. And how important is it for us when we think about sharing ministry with other people that sometimes that's how we invite people into sharing our ministry. Is it there's something that they see, there's something that they say, this is what I can do as well. And how important is that that we kind of share that with others so they take that on themselves? I think it's absolutely essential. And, you know, as I look at her life and then for our viewers and for ourselves, you know, as we translate into 21st century parish life, you know, how many of our parishioners have means? You know, they they have a home and they have food in the refrigerator and they have clothes in the closet, but perhaps their journey is one of loneliness, you know, and to reach out uh, to people in need. So I, th I think especially as I look at her life, it really is the call not just of what, what was beautifully created in those Carmelite sisters, but perhaps that is a charism that should be lived in our parish communities today, mm -hmm. to recognize those who are in need. Uh, certainly in our parishes and in our diocese, we have programs and, and, and mis ministries to the traditional poor, if we will. Mm -hmm. But to recognize that that poverty does transcend all different lines and to see how we're really reaching out to one another and ministering to one another and serving one another. You know, that uh, there is that poverty of spirit, you know, that could be at work in someone that we might never even think of. We might think, well... They've got children. The children could be living in cities across the, the country, but maybe it's a phone call here or there. And, you know, certainly they can take care of themselves, but that companionship. And I think that was something that Angeline was really feeling was lacking, if we could say that, in the Little Sisters of the Poor, at least in her experience, and that she sought to expand. And by exposing ourselves to her, how we can then expand that in our own ministry. We've got one minute left of our uh, time together here for the middle segment. What's, I, what's interesting for me is this Mother Angeline is really a contemporary. She mm -hmm. dies in 1984. So there are many people alive who would have known her, who would have probably worked with her. And, and that's what's wonderful about uh, the Saints of the Americas that we are celebrating in this special series is that there are people that are contemporaries of ours, people that we know that others have walked with and have uh, uh, enjoyed their ministry with. And so that really tells us that the saints are alive among us today. And in the early church, uh, those first Christians were really referred to as the saints. Mm -hmm. And so we too are called to be like the saints. And we could take uh, certainly um, some kind of uh, direction from Mother Angeline to look out for the indigent poor, but especially the elderly among us. Many of them don't have companionship. Many mm -hmm. of them have no one to care for them. And so it's really a call for us to remind ourselves that they are our first priority. We're gonna take a break. Stay with us, we'll be right back. The Society of St. Paul announces a new book on Louis and Zelie Martin, parents of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. The book focuses on her parents' journey towards sanctity in their family life and social commitments. This book was compiled for couple and group sharing and is meant to strengthen the journey of all in marriage and family life towards sanctity and holiness. The book can be found at St. Paul's Books and Gifts at 926 Boardman Poland Road on Route 224, located across from the Olive Garden Restaurant. The store is open Monday through Saturday from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. or call 330-953-2443 or email at stpaulsbookstore at gmail.com and learn more about these witnesses of our time. 
descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nations. Welcome back to our show. We're going to talk now about Dorothy Day. It's interesting, the other two saints and Dorothy Day that we've been talking about in this particular show were all born uh, the middle or the late 19th century. And so they're contemporaries in a sense, but Dorothy Day is probably much more of our contemporary because uh, her influence has really been known around the whole United States. And in particular here uh, within our diocese, but with many dioceses throughout the country. Uh, Dorothy Day is known primarily as a, as a pacifist, as someone who champions the worker. Uh, but she also has a background that is not Catholic. Let's talk about her early days as an Episcopalian. Mm -hmm. Well, and as you said, very much like the two saints that we spoke of in terms of, of birth and, and background, but I would say probably more um, someone we have in common with because of her, her struggles mm -hmm. uh, and because her life wasn't just one that automatically put her in a religious order or, or put her on this, this path. Um, yes, the, the Episcopalian background was one that then, you know, would have invited a uh, kind of a skepticism of Catholicism mm -hmm. um, and what that all meant. Uh, but I think that within that journey of coming to Catholicism, certainly we mm -hmm. see uh, the ringings of that, that sense of peace, uh, that mm -hmm. sense of justice. Uh, it's interesting that at the same time that she then is moving and, and not fully aware of it, but these parallel mm -hmm. structures within the church um, we see that in the late 1900s into the 20th century is when the Catholic Church itself starts to emerge more in this sense of Catholic social mm -hmm. teaching. Um, though we could argue that's always been part of the church, but we see back in with Leo XIII in the late 19th century, this formalized uh, decision to write an encyclical on social justice, on the condition of the worker and the condition of labor. And so it's interesting that she's growing up at the same time that you could say the church is coming of age mm -hmm. in this sense of, of responsibility and, and duty to all people, to provide for all of the citizenry, to uh, have dignity and reverence and respect and to um, honor the blessing of labor and work. And so it's interesting that while the church is growing in that, Dorothy Day is growing and then evolving and coming to that sense of, of what the church might offer her. You know, it's interesting as you were talking, I was thinking that m many of the saints that we talk about and that we know uh, really aren't perfect in their life or throughout their life. Uh, but they have some quality that, that uh, brings them into close union with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so we see this person, Dorothy Day, who lived a, a very bohemian lifestyle in Greenwich mm -hmm. Village in New York, uh, but yet she has um, this whole sense of the need for nonviolence, this, this need to reach out to those who are uh, oppressed or those who are unfairly treated, especially the worker. And we see her giving her life towards this cause. And there's a transformation that happens. And I think that's what happens not only in the lives of all the saints, mm -hmm. uh, but in the lives of all those who, who are Christian, who follow the Lord, that there's this transformation, this change that takes place where you say, because of my baptism, I have decided to follow the Lord in this way. That doesn't mean that I am perfect. It doesn't mean that I adhere to all of these uh, rules and regulations, but my life is such that it speaks to others of the presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. And certainly her life, even though her background and beginnings were very uh, different than what we would think of a saint having, that she moves into this whole sense of uh, advocacy for the poor and for the workers. So let's get into uh, her, uh, her conversion to Catholicism and her sense that, that the Eucharist really is what's driving her because that's uh, what she believes is feeding her, not only spiritually, but also physically in her, in her ministry. Well, and I think it is interesting and, and certainly worth pointing out. Um, I, I read a, a brief article recently that talked about uh, how difficult it's going to be to quote unquote, make saints in the future because of the electronic social media age we live in that you can 
fine dirt, quite frankly, on everybody. And, and the, I found a fallacy in the premise of the article that, well, now it's going to be impossible to canonize saints because we're going to know everything about them. We know everything about Dorothy right. Day. It is not a story that on the surface people would think, well, that's a saint. Mm -hmm. But you bring out an important point. In every saint, it's not that they were perfect. They all have imperfections, some far greater than others. But we pick up their story at their conversion. Yes, mm -hmm. influenced and affected by all of the faults and foibles that we all have, and hers were many. But it's that coming to know Christ. And that's what makes Dorothy Day so important, is it was that, that moment of conversion and that coming to know Christ, certainly a product of everything she had lived and experienced and dealt with. And we would look at things and say, you know, this was tragic or that's certainly not in keeping with how we would live our lives. But it's that moment of conversion that we have to remember in every saint's life. And for her, that conversion truly did become centered on that nourishment of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And that nourishment, that, as you pointed out, was not just spiritual. It was real for her, that this actually taking the flesh of Christ into her own flesh made a difference in her life and made her respond to people differently. And I think, again, that's a great reminder to all of us. How often do people just, we, out of rote, you know, we get up, we get in line, we get our Jesus, we go home. Mm -hmm but that every opportunity to receive that nourishment of the Eucharist, we're taking that into our flesh and it needs to challenge the rest of the day's actions. Mm -hmm. And for Dorothy Day, that became real. It became real in her writings. Mm -hmm. It became real in her activities. It became real in her response to everyone she encountered and everyone she met. Mm -hmm. And it, it changed her life and it changed the lives of everyone she came in contact with. We've got about a minute left of our uh, entire show together, but we do want to mention that, that she began this, um, this social worker network where mm -hmm. she was certainly an advocate uh, for the, the uh, blue collar everyday worker. Mm -hmm. And this, this movement, this Catholic worker movement began back in 1933, uh, shortly very, you know, after the um, uh, all of the upheavals that happen in, in the stock markets and mm -hmm. everything. And so this whole sense that, that she continued this, this mission, but also we would be remiss if we, if we forgot to say that hospitality was something that drove all this, mm -hmm. that she became someone who opened her doors, her life uh, to those who had no home. So that sense of hospitality was, was really the hallmark of who she was and her entire ministry. And so we call this servant of God, Dorothy Day, one who understood great hospitality as we recall uh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph being welcomed into the inn uh, in Bethlehem. Thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. Saints of the Americas was a production of CTNY, the Catholic television network of Youngstown. Your program hosts were Father Jim Corda and Father Jack Lavelle.